Hello. Miniature painting can be quite a challenging hobby, especially for beginners. I often receive questions like, how do I keep my brushes so pointy? How do I even see some of the fine details that I'm painting, never mind actually paint them accurately? Or how do you achieve such smooth coverage with your paints? So I decided to produce this video to help answer some of those questions and offer a range of tips that I hope some of you will find useful, especially if you're new to the hobby. By far the most commonly asked question I tend to receive is what brushes do I use and or how do my brushes stay so pointy? So I use brushes by Rosemary & Co. These are Kalinsky Sable brushes, either the Series 8 or the Series 33, both beautiful brushes. The Series 8 you can see has a slightly longer, more slender design, whereas the 33 is a little shorter, thicker. Now the thing I love about these brushes is they have such a beautifully fine tip. Even though I'm not especially kind to my brushes, much to the horror of some of my viewers, um, despite the battering I give them, they just hold their point really, really well. Sometimes through time and misuse, the brushes might thin down quite a bit. So you may see me using brushes that look a bit like this sometimes. That is actually just another uh, Series 8 brush, size 2 but you can see it's become really thin over time, uh, but still has its uses. So I might use that for getting into really tiny recesses, for example. I do occasionally remember to give my brushes a quick clean with some master's brush cleaner. And giving the brushes a little twist helps them to maintain a nice fine point. But beyond that, I don't really do anything special to maintain my brushes. These are just really great brushes. Now, if you can't get hold of these, because I know they don't ship to the US at the moment, something like the Raphael 8404 is probably your best bet if you live in America. You might also be tempted by these quite cleverly marketed Artis Opus brushes, which I believe are available in the US. These brushes are actually made by Rosemary & Co and are the equivalent of the Series 33 brushes. They've just got a thicker handle and been given a marketing makeover, along with quite a large price increase. So yes, these are nice brushes, but you're paying a lot more for them than if you buy the Series 33 directly from Rosemary & Co. I tend to avoid using really tiny brushes like this 2.0. Uh, it's a nice brush in itself, and it's, it's quite good for things like stippling, for example. But for painting really, really fine details, the problem with tiny brushes, I find, is that they're so small and they hold so little paint. By the time you've actually lined things up to go in to, to add that little detail, Quite often the paint will have dried up to the point where nothing actually flows onto the miniature when you make contact. So I tend to stick to sizes one or two, sometimes a zero. Finally on brushes, it's worth pointing out that every individual brush is quite unique. So if I order a batch of say five or 10 brushes, there may be one of those brushes that doesn't have quite such a fine point as the rest. So that's just something to be mindful of. The next thing that I find helps when it comes to painting details is stability or posture. So I like to use a motorised desk because this allows me to maintain a fairly upright uh, posture whilst I'm working. I'm sitting at a bit of an angle to my desk simply because I normally have my camera here for filming purposes. But you can see I like to have my wrists resting on the work surface. Um, even my elbows are resting here on the table or on the arm of the chair. I like to use quite a small mini holder, which is also resting on the surface. The spare fingers of my brush hand are just resting against the side of the holder like so. So in this position, my whole upper body, arms, hands are really quite rested. And I've got really fine control here where I need it. Now if I just lift my arm up like this. There's a natural bit of tremor or movement there. Probably had a bit too much coffee this morning. But in this position, virtually none of that is transferred through to the paintbrush. I'm not suggesting this is the only way to position yourself when painting miniatures. Some people prefer to use a larger mini holder like this one, for example. Some people paint with their hands up off the desk and just have their elbows resting on the surface. The key thing is to find a position that works for you, both in terms of comfort and stability. Next I'd like to mention paint and paint dilution. I like to use good quality paints that have strong pigments, 
Uh, lately I've been really into the scale color line and also these really nice scale color artists paints. But it's really up to you what paints you use. Whatever paints you might be using, it's good to be mindful of how far you dilute the paints. For glazing or tinting an area, you'll naturally want to thin the paint down accordingly. But otherwise, I generally like to thin the paint just enough to get it to flow nicely from the brush. And for things like small glinting highlights, I really want the paint to be quite dense or opaque. I'm sometimes asked about the scale colour paints specifically because these aren't the most beginner friendly paints in some ways, but I've grown to really enjoy them over the last couple of years, so here's a couple of tips for anyone who might be struggling with them. Firstly, as with any paint line, the opacity of the paints does vary quite a lot from one colour to the next. So Tesla Blue, for example, is really quite translucent, a bit like a fluorescent paint. So trying to use this to achieve a solid base tone, for example, would be quite difficult, but it might be great for tinting or glazing, say. Whereas something like Canterbrick Blue is a lot more opaque, so you'll probably get a really solid base tone in just one layer or maybe two. This variation in the levels of opacity isn't a bad thing, it just means that it's worth really exploring the paints to get a feel for the properties of each colour. Secondly, you might find that the pigments in the paint separate from the medium, which is this clear stuff here. So these paints usually need a really good shake, and dropping in a little agitator or mixer like this can really help with that. So all we do is just pull the top off like so, and drop it inside. And that just really helps to combine the pigments with the medium. There are other materials besides stainless steel agitators. Um, some people worry about these rusting inside the paints. I've never had a problem with that myself, however. So now, after a good shake, you can see there's no clear medium showing at all there. Finally, these paints are a little unusual in that they use a gel type medium or binding agent. This can give them sort of a gloopy feel that can feel odd if you're not used to them. They can be thinned with plain water of course, but I like to add a few drops of flow enhancer to the water that I thin with. This reduces the viscosity of the paint, helping it to flow, and I find just makes the paint a lot easier to work with. It also means I don't need to add as much water when thinning the paint, so I can more easily achieve smooth flowing but really solid base coats for example. The last main topic I want to touch on is lighting and magnification. I don't have much to say on the subject of lighting, as I've mainly only ever used quite a large LED lamp with a softbox, which probably isn't the most practical solution for the average hobbyist, but I would suggest using some kind of daylight lamp, and if you really want to get into things you might want to look for something that has a good colour rendering index, such as this top of the line red grass games lamp for example. And the other thing you can do if you're struggling to paint fine details is simply magnify what you're doing. Now there's a range of magnifying products on the market, uh, magnifying lenses or magnifying lamps or magnifiers that you can wear on your head. I personally don't like having extra stuff around me, especially when I'm filming. But I do however find myself looking at the monitor quite often whilst I'm working. Because I film most of what I do, I have my DSLR camera plugged into my monitor with a HDMI cable. This is mainly just for me to check that I've framed the shots correctly and that everything's in focus but it is also a really useful way of magnifying my work. So whatever you see in my painting videos, that's exactly what I see up on the screen as I'm working. It takes a bit of getting used to as you lose your depth perception when looking at the monitor, but once I'm in position, I don't usually have a problem looking at the monitor as I go in for those little details. All of this raises the broader question of just how important is it to actually paint all of the fine details on a miniature anyway? And that will depend on what kind of painter you are and the reasons for your painting. You might just want to get some colour on your miniatures for gaming purposes, in which case there's really no need to paint things like the eyes because no one's going to see them. These Uruks, for example, are going to sit on the table a few feet away and 10 minutes later will probably be dead anyway, so who cares if we painted the eyes or not. That being said, I did enjoy going to town on the armour just for the sheer pleasure of painting. Some people, however, like to share their work online, in which case you might want to take a bit more care over those kinds of details because they're going to be a lot more visible when people view your work on some kind of screen or device. I kind of fall into both camps myself. I paint to game with, but I also like to share my work online. The other thing I really love to do, which is sort of a hobby within the hobby, is take really epic scenic shots of the figures with some nice terrain in the background. 
So for me personally, it's quite important that I paint the miniatures to a standard where they look good, not just to the naked eye, but also through the lens of a camera. So of course, it's entirely up to you to decide for yourself what level you're aiming for with each miniature you paint. Finally, the other kind of comment I sometimes receive is from viewers who put down their own painting ability, either by saying, oh, I'm rubbish at painting, or oh, I'm never gonna be as good as this person or that person. So my advice to anyone who's new to the hobby is, before you paint your first miniature, take a picture of the unpainted model. Then, once you finish painting your first model, take a picture of the finished result and compare it with the unpainted plastic. And I can guarantee, whatever standard you've reached with your painting is going to look 100 times better than the unpainted model. And then maybe once you've painted another five, 10 or 20 models, take another picture and compare it to your first and I can guarantee you're gonna see a huge amount of progress and improvement. That's not to say, of course, that we shouldn't take inspiration from or learn from more advanced painters, but that's not the same as comparing our work to others. My good friend likes to remind me that comparison is the thief of joy, and I think he's absolutely right about that. So paint for yourself, compare your own work with your previous work, and celebrate every little milestone or achievement. So that just about does it for this video. Thank you so much for joining me, and as always, happy painting.